accountants world. Our speaker today is Brian Tankersley, director at K2 Enterprises, and he'll be speaking on artificial intelligence and machine learning, a roadmap. I want to thank you for joining us today. My name is Div Bensali. I'm vice president at Accountants World. We're really pleased to be able to bring you this really interesting topic and present about one of the one of the experts on this particular area. A couple of quick points on the GoToWebinar control panel. Um, you can expand and hide the control panel using the orange arrow. You can cl click on audio uh, to choose either your telephone or computer speakers to listen in. If you choose phone, it'll give you a dial-in number and an access code there. If you haven't downloaded Brian's slide deck, you can go under handouts and there's a PDF in there for that. And finally, if you have any questions for Brian or myself during the presentation, just click on the questions tab, enter in your question, click send, and that will come through to us. And we'll be taking some questions during the presentation and some at the end as well. We do offer one free CP for today's webinar. Uh, three things you need to do in order to get CP. Attend the live webinar for no less than 50 minutes respond to all four of the polling questions this says three or more there will be four today so you have to respond to all four of those to get credit um, and then finally as soon as you close out of the webinar there will be a post webinar survey and you can fill it out right then on the spot when you close out the go to webinar window um, if you don't see it or you forget to fill it out no worries we'll email you a link and you can send it back to us uh, with your completed uh, results on there you will be notified by email that you've received your CP. Make sure to ask, uh, add webinar at accountantsworld.com to your trusted email list to make sure that uh, any notifications about CP come through. I also wanted to mention that uh, Accountants World will be releasing just in the next couple of weeks something that we are really excited about. Um, many of you have been thinking about offering client accounting services. Perhaps you've begun to offer them already, um, or perhaps you're not uh, sure yet exactly what the value would be to you and to your clients. Um, so we are we at Accounts World would like to uh, think of ourselves as as the pioneers in giving accountants the tools to offer client accounting services. Uh, um, that's the bread and butter of our accounting solution, accounting power. <coughs> Excuse me. And so uh, our CEO, Dr. Chandra Bansali, and our Director of Practice Development, Hitendra Patel, have put together a document that is going to be really useful for beginners, intermediate, and advanced CAS users alike. It's a practical guide to offering client accounting services. It takes you step by step through everything that you need to know and how you need to uh, approach your clients with CAS offerings, how you should be pricing them, um, and what types of clients to begin with. So it, it sort of covers everything that you, you need to know to begin to get your cash practice off the ground, begin to see benefits for both you and your clients within 60 to 90 days, and then where you go in phase two beyond that as well. So as I mentioned, this is gonna be released to the public in August, but if you'd like to get an advanced copy of the guide uh, very shortly here, on our post-webinar survey, there's going to be a question uh, which we'll be asking about that. So you can just indicate yes, and we'll go ahead and email that guide out to you as soon as it's, as soon as it's available in early August. Before I turn over the presentation to Brian Tankersley, uh, if you don't know who Brian is, he's one of the leading authorities on accounting technology issues and has been for 20 years. He's been voted one of the top 25 thought leaders in public accounting technology seven times, and he's the co-author of the Accounting Firm Operations and Technology Survey. So at this time, I'd like to go ahead and turn the floor over to Brian Tankersley. Brian, do we have you on? Might still be muted right now. All right, I see your screen, Brian, but I am not hearing your audio.
Brian, I'm still not hearing you at this point. I'm not sure if uh, if the audience is. So audience, if, if you're hearing him fine, let me know. But otherwise, I'm going to assume that you're not hearing him either. Okay, we're going to work on it with Brian on this to try to figure out if there's an audio issue happening on his side. Um, and actually, now that I remembered it, while we're figuring that out, uh, Brian had wanted me to launch the first poll question. So um, I can actually go ahead and do that while Brian's getting back online here. So here goes the first poll question. You should be seeing it in front of you right now. And the question is, how concerned are you about the future impact of artificial intelligence and machine learning on your practice? So based on on what you've heard so far, uh, before we go through the presentation, what's your level of uh, with regards to AI and machine learning? I don't know enough to know if I should be concerned, not at all, somewhat, or very concerned. So please go ahead and select one of those options and click the submit button. A reminder that voting in all of the poll questions is uh, required in order to earn CP today. And so we've got about 90% of people almost have voted so far. Um, so uh, we'll wait just about 10 more seconds here for people to get their votes in. All right. Going once, going twice. Okay. So it looks like uh, almost half of you are somewhat concerned, 13% uh, very concerned. So 58% of you are somewhat or very concerned. And a, a third said, I don't know enough to know if I should be concerned or not, which is obviously fine. That's why we're all here today. Um, Brian, do we have you back on at this point? Okay, bear with us, folks. Let me uh, let me go ahead and see. Um, Tom or Sharon, would you mind trying him on his uh, on his mobile and see if you can uh, reach him that way? Okay, will do. Are you hearing me now, guys? Yes, I can hear you super. now. Okay, super. Um, all right, so I guess I need to get y'all to make me, looks like I need to get y'all to make me the presenter, and we'll be ready to go. My yep. apologies Please about that. I'm not exactly sure what's here. going on here. There we are. Okay, super duper, folks. That's how it usually works, isn't it? It's always when you try to when you try to get everything going, you get it off. You know, it's always gets interesting. All right, folks. Well, welcome. Uh, my name is Brian Tankersley. Uh, this session is called Artificial Intelligence and Machine Learning: A Roadmap. And so, what we're going to do during this session is go through and give you some basic information about AI and ML, and uh, get you, uh, you know, just kind of help you understand. What the, what the stuff, um, what we've basically got in here going on with it, okay? Uh, Div introduced you. Uh, this is me. Um, I'm actually calling you from this number on the slide, but you can see my email address there, brian at k2e.com. Always glad to take, uh, you know, again, if you've got a five-minute question, I'm glad to throw a couple minutes at it and see what I can do to help. Now, um, as we look at all of this, you know, I was actually on a webinar earlier today from another software provider, and the uh, presenter, who is an architect, actually mentioned that uh, there was a there was a fee, there was a, cons a belief among many people that the accounting profession was going to get largely automated using its artificial intelligence and machine learning. Um, I think there will be some of that, but I think you know it's. You know, I, what I would remind all of you as we're, we start looking at AI and machine learning here is that we still like speaking to humans, even though we have interactive voice response things. You know, in the 80s, I was going to lose my job to uh, to the microcomputer. In the 90s, they said the Internet was going to eat my job. In the 2000s, everybody said that... Um, 
uh, what did they? So it said outsourcing was going to eat my job. Folks, it's 2018 and I'm still here. Okay, so I think it, what, it, what it means, though, you know, if we think back to what my job was like when I started when I started out in the 90s with one of the big firms, um, I used to use four column, seven column, and 14 column paper and an adding machine and pencils all the time. I use none of those in my job today. So I have had to change the tools that I use as a result of this. So. Um, we're going to go through here and look at just some general emerging technologies. And, you know, it, it's it, in here, there are quite a few to be thinking about. You know, the top two, machine learning and artificial intelligence are what we're focusing on today. We also have blockchain and cryptocurrencies and cognitive computing, big data. And actually, big data is a kind of a condition precedent for for all of this, okay, because big data um, is really the thing, having enough data drives this, uh, drives having all this. Um, you can see we have quantum computing in there as well. You know, in the physical world, we're seeing automation in things like uh, drones to deliver, deliver things, robotics, 3D printing, uh, voice interfaces like our Alexa devices, and mine just lit up too. Um, and, you know, there are many, many other things that are going on. Now, the thing to understand is there's a sense of panic that's gripped a lot of people related to AI and machine learning in particular. And I'm just going to show you a thing called Amero's Law. And so this is a this is a uh, truism that basically talks about the impact of technological changes. And we assume that there's going to be a whole lot of change on the front end and not so much on the back end. But, but we, it's exactly opposite. There's not much change in the beginning. Uh, but we often underestimate uh, what the long-term impact is. You know, think about technologies like Facebook that are out there that you use. Um, you know, my son is 16 now, and so he's starting to think about girls much more often. And as we uh, as we look at as I look at the way he interacts with them and so forth, um, it's texting that he's doing and things like that. So it's a it's, it's, you know, things that we didn't do back in the dark ages in the 80s when you didn't have a cell phone and you had to use the landline and, and those kinds of things, all right? So, um, you know, if you think about how much Facebook, LinkedIn, Twitter, and other things like that have changed your life, uh, really, you know, we really kind of underestimate things. You know, Facebook is only about 15 years old now, um, which, you know, is younger than my son. So as we're, as we're going through looking at this, you know, it's not been that long ago that uh, Mr. Zuckerberg and the Winklevoss twins were, were doing their dance. Um, anyway, as we, uh, as we look at this now, we have um, also got kind of a relationship of the emerging technologies. Don't worry about this for right now, but I, I want to kind of give you a basis. What, what we thought here was Randy and I did this together, and the idea was that we had um, we had all the all the emerging technologies are based on a base down here at the bottom of general computing, graphical computing, uh, and quantum computing. Okay, quantum computing obviously is an emerging technology. The general computing is like the Intel chips that you use, and then the graphics computing are the things like ATI and NVIDIA have uh, that we use to drive our multiple external displays. And much of it is based on big data. Uh, so for to use most of many of these emerging technologies, we've got to have a lot of data so that the computer can learn from it, for example, in the case of machine learning. Uh, if we look at cognitive computing, this is where we um, this is where we're using computers to solve problems kind of like a human would. Um, and so that's another major area. Uh, now, if we look at the intersection, that's going to be predictive analytics. So the idea here is that we're looking at the data, and we're looking at it the way we would in problem-solving method, and we end up with some solutions. Now, I've added in some additional things in here. You can see we have artificial intelligence, voice and vision, machine learning as, as circles. Notice that uh, there, there's a subset of machine learning that looks at some of the specific chips uh, that are being used successfully for machine learning by Amazon, Microsoft, and Google and others. Uh, you can see also that we've got 3D computing over here, robotics and drones, and then blockchain sitting over here is a data store. Okay, uh, The real thing that blockchain does for you is it really just gives, you know, I actually wrote a column on it called um, block, blockchain is a database, get over it, because I got tired of hearing about all the hype about blockchain. It's interesting, it's an interesting technology and it's going to change a lot of things, but it's not going to cure cancer or make your teeth whiter or make you more attractive to members of the opposite sex, except to the extent that it gives you a lot more money so that you can do what you need to do there, okay? Uh, but you can see that we have blockchain over in, 
in this side. And just think of blockchain as a ledger. Uh, that's really all it is. It's a ledger that can't be modified, uh, can't, really can't be modified. Okay. So let's go ahead and move on to the next one. We're going to start by looking at the show, star of the show here, which is data, which is what we have to have for um, just about all of these. And so notice that if we look at our transaction processing engines that we have today, um, you'll notice that, um, that again, we, we have a lot more data that's in structured format that we can access these days. Uh, when all this stuff was done on paper on things like uh, analog cash registers and so forth, uh, notice that uh, notice that we have this digital exhaustive data that we can use to validate things. Okay, And so what that means is that if I'm doing asset-based lending based on receivables and inventory, let's say, to a, to a company as a bank, if I can look at their cloud accounting package like that from accountants world and see into what when they're entering transactions and what's getting entered natively and what's um, what they're entering after the what they're entering after the fact in batches suddenly now I can make quite different decisions about what I'd like to do and what I think I want to do uh, with with the data uh, because now it's easier to see because there are more tells that we have that are going to more tells there that you have that will actually tell you uh, whether uh, you know whether something's valid or not. Okay. Now, um, if we continue on through this, I've got a first, I've got a future uh, real-time transaction validation model where I have all these inputs. Maybe they get aggregated by somebody, or maybe they're they're aggregated by the bank or by the accounting firm or somebody like that. But the idea here is that I can start validating the data that's in the sales funnel in their CRM system um, for the different statuses of things in the sales funnel. So I have the sales funnel up here, which is you know again we have uh, leads and they turn into uh, prospects and then they move through the cycle and they end up you you make a value proposition and then there's a uh, then there's a, an offer and then there's an order shipped delivered cash and so as I'm trying to quantify what's in these different statuses since I now have this external data uh, that's validatable here it's changing the way audits are getting are getting done uh, now, as we look at this, though, for AI machine learning, we we use data science kind of in the back end. Um, if you think of the, if you think of this uh, this neutral bullet we have for uh, to create a smoothie, um, the idea is that if you if you have the smoothie, the algorithm used for data science is the recipe. Your data is the ingredients. The computer is a blender, and then your answer is the smoothie that kind of gives you the the end result that you're looking for. Now, what are you looking for? Well, data science actually answers five questions, okay? Is this A or is it B? Okay, so is it sunny outside or is it overcast? Uh, is it raining or is it not raining? Is this weird is another one. So is, is this one outside of the norm? Uh, we might look at this and say, okay, uh, somebody's got a house that's, uh, that's 80 feet wide at the front. That might be normal where you live and not normal somewhere else. On the other hand, if somebody had a three foot wide house, that would be weird. Uh, and if they had a, a 3000 foot wide house, that would be weird too. So the idea is that you're looking for stuff that's outside the limits. Uh, the third thing here is how much or how many. Uh, so, so that one's going to be, again, looking for numerical predictions. Number four, how's this organized? Are there clusters of things in here? Are there steps in the increase of this, or does it increase, is the increase directly proportional to the increase in something else? And the last one we have here is what should I do next? So uh, where do I go, where do I go from the next thing? So uh, there are algorithms for each of these. Again, classification, A or B, multi-class, pick the most likely. So if you're in California and you have a, you have a bill that comes through, uh, through your bank feeds in accountants world and it's from Pacific Gas and Electric, um, an algorithm could look at that and say, hmm, that's probably utilities expense or something like that. Similarly, if they saw Hampton Inn, it's probably some kind of hotel expense, whether it's a meeting expense or a, um, or a travel expense. Expense. So notice that uh, notice that with classification we can pick those things out, and we're starting to see that kind of stuff creep in at this point. Um, we're also seeing anomaly detection. So uh, you know, if I give you an example, when I first started traveling for a living, I got a um, I, I got an American Express card, and 
with my Amex card, they, you know, hadn't been issued. It was, you know, I was self-employed. So I had my, had the, my Amex platinum card. And every time I rented a car, they freaked out and made me call them. Uh, so I would have the Hertz or Avis membership where I should be able to just walk to the car. And I never got to walk to the car, uh, because they thought it was weird that I said on my application, I was a CPA and that I was in Dubuque, Iowa today. And then I was in Salt Lake city tomorrow. And then, uh, the next day I was in Seattle and so forth. And so, um, so this, uh, I guess this anomaly detection algorithm they had showed that up as a credit card fraud. Now that got fixed pretty quick, but um, you notice that their algorithm picked it up. They had to change my SIC code in my profile so that I could, I could get away with renting cars there. Okay. Now the next thing we have is regression. These are numerical predictions of what things are going to be based on inputs, uh, clustering and how's data organized and then reinforcement learning. What do I do next? We learn from outcome, decide on the next action and go from there. Now, you need to think about this because if you're going to use data to make decisions, it needs to be accurate data. So there's actually a new job that's going to be available to many people that are unskilled, uh, cleaning up data that we have that's been uh, that's uh, that again that's that's been gathered from somewhere. So it's going to be things like cleaning up address data that people have put into web forms and uh, make, you know doing geo validate you know doing address validation scripts against things and uh, checking the checking answers for consistency between there. So for example, if somebody said they were a solo practitioner and they had a hundred employees. Well, that's, that's pretty weird. <laughs> you know, again, when they say they didn't have, you know, solo practitioner implies you have zero employees. Um, a sole practitioner or a, or just a, uh, a, a proprietorship might imply you have some employees, but a sole practitioner would imply you have none. And then if you said you had a hundred, well, that doesn't make any sense. Okay. So that's the kind of stuff that we've, that we've done in the past looking at things like the CPA firm survey and so forth. Um, so relevant, connected. Is it accurate? Is it good enough to work with? And so cleaning that data up and looking for outliers and things that you need to deal with is a challenge that you have. Now, machine learning is one of the thing, one of the major strategic technologies. Um, there are six leading companies in this area by every, all the research that Randy Johnston and I have done together on it. And it looks like four of them are Chinese. The other two are Google and Facebook. And we actually have, um, there's a gal that actually used to work for Zero that I know that actually works with Google with machine learning services. And it's something that's growing pretty radically. Um, it does require a lot of data and input and uses graphics processing units or specialized chips. Uh, so uh, you've got some options out there at the end. Google's got some special chips or you can use what's called a field programmable gate array, which is a reprogrammable chip, that micro which is Microsoft's approach. Um, and as we look at this, this threatens knowledge worker jobs in the long run. Um, and leads to a natural concentration of intellectual and computing skills in a small number of large firms. Uh, there's a saying that is big data the new big brother, and I think there's been uh, there's been a, quite a bit of outrage against Facebook and others in the wake of the Cambridge Analytica uh, I, Cambridge Analytica scandal and others. Uh, you know, I've always been concerned about Facebook um, and and its influence on various on politics and uh, you know balkanizing as where we're we're more and we don't have more centralized sources of news. Uh, but at the same time, you know, I, I think it's just, I think it's uh, finally hitting home for some folks now because it's being used by, it's being used by the Republicans instead of being used solely by the Democrats. So it's an interesting, uh, interesting world we have. And I think it's leading to the polarization we have of our politics because we're able to conduct ourselves and get a lot of our news in an echo chamber. Now, for machine learning, it's a, again termed by IBM in 1959. So, you know, I just mind remind you that that's going to be 60 years ago next year. Um, it shifted to practical, solvable problems. Um, there are algorithms uh, to do this, but you typically need a million records or more to do this. Okay, so that's why it's so important that you get your data in the cloud or whatever data set you want to automate into the cloud to do this. Because if, if you none of you probably have a million records in your client bookkeeping practice, or your tax practice, or whatever, but if you combine all of the practitioners in a particular area or in your association or perhaps in an, in an organization like your state CPA society um, or everybody that uses a particular tax software and you've got that data in the cloud, 
suddenly now you have the algorithms that you can use to do this. There are two approaches to this. There's supervised learning, where you have example inputs and desired outputs. Um, you can have semi-supervised, where there's some training but not complete. There's active things where you label instances by users. So uh, when you do a CAPTCHA and it gives you a series of pictures that says which of these has a car, you're also implicitly training that computer algorithm on how to spot a vehicle in that picture. Um, so reinforcement in here, uh, where training data is dynamic, like playing a game or driving, uh, those are all supervised learning things. There's also unsupervised learning, where there's no label and it just discovers hidden patterns in the data. That's the more interesting part that we have. Now, for machine learning output, notice that these are very similar to data science algorithms. And so uh, we can classify things, we can do regression, we can do clustering, we can do density estimation, and we can do dimensional dimensionality re reduction uh, to kind of simplify the inputs by mapping them to similar topics. Okay, So notice those are almost exactly the same as the data science algorithms that we had. Um, now, there are quite a few different approaches as well, decision tree learning, association rules, artificial neural networks um, in here, uh, deep learning, inductive logic programming, support vector machines, clustering, and Bayesian networks. So what I'd like you to see is that there are many different approaches that you have, and there are even more on the next slide um, as, we, as we go through all of these. So what you need to understand is that when you talk about machine learning, it can be any of these 14 or so different approaches, and it could be a combination of some of them as well. So this is something where it's early enough that we've not completely standardized the approach to solving many of the common problems. Now, there are other areas related to machine learning, including um, data mining, uh, where we're using the same methods, but we're focusing on uh, discovery rather than prediction. Uh, we have predictive analytics, uh, where we're trying to predict things uh, and produce reliable, repeatable results, uh, computational statistics, and then computational learning theory as well. So, so as we start looking at this, there are some examples out there, okay? So receipt banks, or excuse me, Zero says that if you get four transactions from any user, they can post it. So once you've got from a user for a vendor, they know where to post it. Banks are using this to establish credit in Australia. Intuit is also using that sum um, in, you know, with their relationship with Quicken Loans. Uh, receipt Bank, a great tool out there. Uh, it classifies transactions. They say with 100% accuracy, I'd say mid-90s, okay? That's um, not made any mistakes in my use of it over time, uh, but you know, 100% accuracy, that's a pretty, it's a pretty bold claim uh, after being classified once. I will tell you that I have been for some time scanning receipts in our tech conferences using the Receipt Bank, and it has been accurately identifying the vendors once I've had a similar receipt that's been classified in the past. Okay, so it's it's not failed me yet, and I'm doing this live without a net in front of people in tech conferences with receipts that have never been put into Receipt Bank before, and it's worked out just fine. Um, QBO bank reconciliation, cybersecurity, dark trace. Uh, you know, there's there's actually for security, um, there are artificial intelligence and machine learning applications that are going in and looking for unusual behavior. So if you've got if you've been infected with a um, with a with vir with a malware, let's say like a uh, let's say a crypto a cryptocurrency or crypto virus, um, or a, you know so if that if you've been hit with ransomware, uh, then it will notice patterns like uh, the com this application or this process is suddenly trying to open thousands of applications at once, write them, and then close them, and so an, a machine learning algorithm might or AI algorithm might look at that behavior and say that doesn't make any sense. It's outside the normal behavior and shut it down. Uh, so that's that's an example of where we might use this. Email filtering and OCR, you know, uh, I remember Div in the in the in initial startup to this, he actually announced that one of the challenges uh, that he has is to is to make sure that you get the email from uh, from accountants world uh, with your receipt with your uh, with your attendance certificate, okay? Uh, because sometimes it gets flagged as spam. So notice that when we think about this, none of this stuff is firing at 100% yet, but all of it is better than what we had five years ago and, and, and stuff that we couldn't dream of doing 30 years ago, okay? So with that, uh, Div, are we ready for the, net, for the first polling question?
Yep, I'll go ahead and launch the uh, the second poll question actually right now. Um, okay. So, folks, you should see it in front of you. When do you think the use of AI machine learning will have a significant impact on your practice? You have five choices there, so please go ahead and select one of those options and make sure to click the submit button. Uh, reminder, this is the second of the four polling questions today, and answering all four of the poll questions is required in order to earn CPE. And so we'll go ahead and give about 10 to 15 more seconds here for folks to go ahead and uh, submit their responses. All right, just a few final seconds here. If you haven't voted, please go ahead and do so. And remember to click the submit button to make sure your vote gets counted. All and right. I'm sorry about our audio trouble. Sorry about our audio trouble earlier. I was really hoping to to see that first response in there, but I'll look at that later, I guess. Okay. Yeah, the most uh, common response was somewhat uh, concerned, and the second most common uh -huh. was I'm not sure yet. Uh, so the, yeah. those yeah. two made up uh, about 70 to 75 percent, I believe, of the responses. All right. So we'll go ahead and close this poll out here. Um, and so, Brian, on this one, 35% uh, said in two to five years, uh, and then pretty equal split above and below that uh, in the next two years and between five and 10 years from now. Yeah, yeah, and that's, that's about what I'd expect. Um, there, are some, there are some places where it's being used, but it's not being used in a radical amount. Uh, so, you know, there's, it, but it doesn't mean you need to rest on your laurels, to be sure. Okay, so uh, thank you, Dev. Appreciate that. Now, um, one thing I will mention to you, by the way, about that is that um, one of the key things you ought to be doing wherever possible is automating the retrieval of bank statements and the retrieval of um, retrieval of things like bank transactions um, and and check copies and so forth. OK, Accountants World does this. But, uh, you know, again, that's I wouldn't really consider that AI or machine learning. I would just consider that automation. And so there is even though the AI stuff, uh, there hasn't been that much in the world of AI and machine learning yet that has hit production world of, of accountants, what I would suggest to you is that there is significant automation, including things like programmable rules you can set up today that will, uh, that will help you be significantly more productive. Uh, so these are some of the um, some of the machine learning applications that are out there. Uh, so uh, you know, brain machine interfaces, uh, effective computing, um, computer networks, uh, computer vision, uh, detecting credit card fraud, game playing. Uh, notice that uh, that there's actually been in the game of Go, which is one of the one of the most uh, variable games out there. Um, th there's actually machine learning has been used to create a per, a machine that can beat humans at beat the human world champion at go with this insurance internet fraud detection marketing machine learning control perception diagnosis here uh, notice that notice that again um, there are there are things like this that by having a lot of data you can you can interpret things well. Um, you know, one of the first areas, one of the first areas where I think humans are going to be affected is going to be in radiology because um, there are things that are detected by slight variations not detectable to the human eye in radiology um, in medical diagnosis that can, in fact, there are some machine learning algorithms now that will detect uh, unusual items more, you know, better. Um, than humans do, inexperienced radiologists with years of experience. So uh, other things here, natural language processing, you know, again, things like Alexa, um, search engines, um, you know, self-driving cars, speech handwriting reg reg recognition, and so forth, okay? So there are many, many things out here. Now, here are some free software suites. I'm not going to read all these to you, but uh, you can see there's one. Uh, here's a... Here's a second slide uh, with some proprietary ones uh, that we have out there. And so these are the ones that you can go get that, that cost money. The ones in the previous slide are actually free, so you can actually just go get them and play with them if you want to. Uh, so if you have a college student that's interested in doing this, although there are some things that you can do uh, with proprietary suites, uh, notice that much of the stuff is free. Okay. So kind of in summary, uh, we, this is a method of data analysis that automates our analytical model building. Um, there are a lot of organizations 
organizations uh, that, that have tools to do this. You'll recall that um, you know Google's got their cloud AI chips and those tensor processing units. Uh, we have Amazon Web Services with uh, services in that area, um, IBM Watson, SAS, quite a few others. Um, the, if you, there are risks, if you're using the wrong data set or if you have an unguided conclusion, you may get an unexpected result and we're going to use this when data can answer a question. Um, it can be free on open source applications where you just have to pay for the power and spend the time setting it up or it could be up to $10,000 an hour like uh, some, of the, some of the virtual machine instances that use one of Google's proprietary tensor processing units. Okay? And I've actually put some links in here so you can actually click on those links and go to those and see more about them. Now, our next topic we have is going to be artificial intelligence. And so uh, this is where we have a machine that mimics cognitive functions that are things like humans would do. And um, as AI gets better, some things that used to be considered AI years ago, like optical character recognition, are considered to be solved and, and are reliable. You know, if you look at the if you look at the reliability of the receipts uh, that I get when I run through one tap receipts or receipt bank, it's absolutely amazing. Uh, you know, in fact, the only thing that really ever gives my gives gives them a problem is when I write in when I write illegibly the tip amount and then the final amount on a receipt. So uh, that's that's you know one of the challenges I guess with that is that you still it's the human related stuff that again messes it up in many cases. Now uh, the AI includes human speech, autonomous cars, interpreting complex data and other things like this. Um, it requires a lot of computational resources to do this. All right. So um, I just want you to be aware that when we start looking at things like self-driving cars, and I don't have an example of a self-driving car. I actually have a picture in another slide deck that I could show you uh, with a picture of the trunk in self-driving cars. But if you look at the prototypes that are out there, they're either electric cars like Tesla's or they're hybrid cars like the Ford, the Ford Focus hybrid that that um, Ford has that is their that is their prototype. And inevitably, when you look in the trunk or the boot of these devices, they will have an entire rack of servers in there. And uh, you know, I actually asked an engineer at the Consumer Electronics Show uh, the last uh, asked two engineers that the last two years at, at CES. Whether the um, whether the wheel motors or the computers in the back require more power um, off of that hybrid car, and they said truthfully they didn't know, but it was probably pretty close either way. So as we're thinking about this now, it takes a huge amount of data to to do some of these artificial intelligence type things. Um, so there are other risks, you know, devaluation of humanity, decrease in demand for labor, um, artificial moral agents, machine ethics. Um, Robot rights, super intelligence. You know, if you look at the 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 pe the, the animal rights uh, that we we uh, that many people subscribe to animals these days, um, you know, it, it's not it's not that hard to believe that there could be robot rights. You know, if you think back to 2001: A Space Odyssey about the HAL 9000, the psychotic computer that killed the crew of a spaceship on the way to Jupiter, um, this robot rights thing. You know, at what point does does a computer that has AI become a sentient being? And so there's some interesting ethical questions to be asked there. Uh, now, um, as we look at uh, AI facts, again, uh, started out at a, and again in Dartmouth about 60 years ago, around the same time we started looking at machine learning, um, divided into subfields like robotics and machine learning. A lot of traditional goals include reasoning, knowledge, planning, learning, natural language processing, perception, and explainability. Um, and so many of these will use search and mathematical optimization, uh, neural networks, uh, and things based on stats, probability, and economics. Um, Lisp is a language that was actually designed uh, to do this in the 60s, 70s, 80s, and uh, was used until about 1987. And uh, it's really defined into three traditions, okay? So compute, computational psychology, Computational philosophy and computer science, and so with those, um, the you know together again gives you the human behavior, mind, and actions make up your artificial intelligence. 
Now, as outputs, um, it's been 20 years ago that the world chess champion at the time, Gary Kasparov, who's now a dissident in Russia, um, before he got into politics, uh, he was the world champ chess champion uh, when he was beat by Deep Blue, one of the first computers in there. Um, in February 2011, um, Ken Jennings uh, got beat by a significant margin by IBM Watson. And again, in 2017, uh, KG, uh, who was the number one uh, Go player in the world, was beat by AlphaGo, which was a which was actually trained by artificial intelligence and machine learning methods. Uh, now, as we uh, as we look at at all of these, there are a number of different uh, number of different approaches in here we have uh, that that are related to neurology. Um, as we as we think about many of these, there are logic based things. You know, again, if you're if you're thinking about this. Uh, there's one approach where you could end up with something where is, you know, something that's similar to, it's very logical, like Mr. Spock in, uh, in Star Trek. And we could also have somebody who's very emotional, like Captain Kirk in Moody. Uh, so those things could happen as well as we do this. Uh, we also have anti-logic, uh, which is a couple of folks that found that solving problems in vision and natural language required some ad hoc solutions. Um, we have knowledge-based and sub-symbolic, um, sub-symbolic uh, tools here as well as embodied intelligence uh, now um, as we as we start looking at many of these um, neural networks and connectionism led to kind of some soft computing approaches including fuzzy systems uh, you know there are tools like that built into most of your database servers where it can you know if you turn down the if you turn on the the fuzzy logic matching you can look for Brian F Tankersley and and uh, you know, Brian Franklin Tankersley and Tankersley, comma, Brian F or Tankersley, comma, B Franklin. And it could identify those, all those as the same person potentially. And so those fuzzy systems basically do that. Um, we also have some sophisticated mathematical tools uh, to solve some specific uh, sub problems in here. Um, and we have intelligent agents that perceives the environment and takes the actions that maximize the chance of success. So what are we trying to solve in AI? Well, what we're trying to solve is reasoning uh, to go in and mimic the human ability to guess faster and more accurately. Uh, you know, there are tools, uh, you know, we can use, we use linear programming historically for that, uh, and we can do that kind of stuff in Excel, but uh, there's actually some AI built into it, into Microsoft Excel, believe it or not. Uh, there's a tool, um, there's a tool that you have where you can, uh, you can basically put in a pattern uh, that you have for parsing some stuff apart and then, uh, use that example and then the then Excel will actually use AI to go in and try to uh, replicate what you've done okay so there's a, it's, I believe it's called uh, called fill something anyway it's an interesting little tool that was introduced in office 2013 um, if we look at this now um, a representation of what exists is an ontology and so um, this set of objects relations concepts and properties are described so that software agents can interpret them you know so we look at things like what is which of these pictures is of a cat and so in a machine learning algorithm we might feed thousands of pictures in there and then have humans give input to say this is what a cat looks like this is not what a cat looks like and then you might end up with concepts like this is what ears look like and this is what a tail looks like and then that feeds into what a cat looks like in this uh, representation uh, we also have intelligent agents um, intelligence agents in here uh, that can set goals and then uh, the study of algorithms that improve through experience now, natural language processing that we have is out here, and it's much better than it used to be. But if you've asked Siri or Alexa or anyone to do anything lately, what you'll find is that they sometimes misinterpret what you say. Uh, so, uh, you know, again, I've 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 been pretty happy with the stuff that has been done by uh, by my Alexa devices, but again, as we're as we're trying to figure this out, uh, you know, again, you just need to go back and talk to Siri and talk to Alexa, and what you realize is that there's a long way to go with the things that we consider to be uh, that we consider to have have a pretty good handle on. There's still a long way to go before we can interpret things like uh, you know you know subtexts that are going on and reading things into stuff based on uh, kind of the vibe that you have in a conversation. We also have perception to pull information information in. Uh, so we're actually seeing that come in now with Facebook and other things where when you put a picture into Facebook, 
it will recognize you and ask you if you want to tag yourself in it. Uh, so that's something we have. We also have motion, motion and manipulation. Uh, so we're trying to go through and ha having robots handle tasks like manipulating things. Um, as you're thinking about this now, social intelligence is also important uh, because you know it's it's uh, the you know the we need to have systems that can develop, recognize, that can recognize, interpret, process, and simulate human emotions uh, so that we can connect with them. Um, for creativity, uh, you know, we could have, uh, we want to have inputs, we want to have, have it generate outputs like music and art, and, you know, it's, it's not going to be super easy for somebody to be their own little Van Gogh because the complexity and the, uh, the, the things that are created by the, by these systems, you know, need to be unique enough and, and novel enough that they're actually useful. Uh, we also have general, artificial general intelligence. And if you go back and look at the, um, at the Gartner hype cycle, artificial general intelligence, according to the hype cycle, is about 10 years out. Okay. So what's going to happen in the, in the net, before, before general adoption anyway, um, according to, according to their research. And as we're looking at this generalized artificial intelligence or artificial general intelligence, um, understand that we see this in children where a baby comes out, it can't communicate it at all. Then it gets one years old and it can say mama, data, and simple things. Then it gets up to two and three and four and suddenly it says why every five seconds. And then it moves on and when it gets to be about 16 or 17 or 18, it suddenly thinks you're an idiot. Okay. So, and then it, then at 25, it comes back to its senses and suddenly realizes that maybe you had something going on there. So as we're looking at this artificial general intelligence, Understand that there's a cycle that humans go through of about 25 years till they figure out their parents may actually have something going on. And it's going to take some time now for us to accept that computers have things going on and us to trust them doing things. So what does it mean to accounting? Well, we have things like Zoho Zia that's, uh, that's out there. Zoho Zia, will, you can ask questions of it. There's a chat bot with it. And it will go through and, and do things like figure out when you need to post your social media posts. Um, in auditing, there are tools like MindBridge. They have some AI in here. Financial services, there's a ton of AI in, in financial services. Much of it targeted at looking for any money, looking for money laundering. Um, Salesforce has a tool called Prediction.io that will tell you when to call your calls based on prior experience. Um, notice that in Google, Google actually has added this, and I added this slide today. This is actually a text from my mom and my some texting with my mom, my sister, and my family. And notice that Google is suggesting in the middle of my Android app uh, how I should respond to this uh, to this query or this text from my sister. And so notice you can see the button show up there. And you'll see that show up in uh, Facebook and other places in the future. There are also apps like Crane AI that will write things for you. Um, so again, uh, from any money laundering, again, uh, Visual Inspector by SAS cost a billion to develop. Um, 50 to 70% of the compliance money that banks spend right now is on AML. Financial firms spend about 4% now and about 10% in 2022. It generates these things called suspicious activity reports or SARS. Um, we don't hear much about SARS, but uh, when there was the when there was a significant cash payment to I think it was Stormy Daniels by the by the president, I believe there was a suspicious activity report filed because there was a large amount of cash handled. Um, so as we um, as we look at this now, you've got others. Uh, Others in here as well, but again, these anti-money laundering regulations are, are up pretty significantly in the developed world. 10% uh, North America, your EU, 15% in Australia, and many of the other Commonwealth countries. And part of the reason, frankly, that the regulations are being emphasized more in other parts of the world, like India, for example, um, is that they have value-added tax. And so if you have transactions that are in the black market, uh, they never get the tax never gets paid on them. So here's an ADP, um, here's hey, Brian, an ADP uh, analysis. Hey. Sorry, should I, uh, do you want me to go ahead and launch the third poll question at this point or wait a couple of slides on that? Uh, let's go ahead and, um, you know what, um, let's go ahead and launch it now, I guess. That'll be a great time. Okay, sounds great. Thanks, um, I skipped so over that when I got to this one. No, no problem. 
Okay, so you should see the third poll question in front of you at this point. The question is, how far is your firm in its transition to cloud-based applications? Five choices there. Select one of those and then click the Submit button. And, and, just, and, just, a and just a reminder, today we'll have one more coming up in just a few minutes here. All right, so let's take just about 10 more seconds here for people to get their votes in. Folks, if you haven't voted yet, please go ahead and select and click Submit to make sure your vote gets counted. Okay, going once, going twice, and here we go. Okay, so Brian, 35% said we've done a little but still have a long way to go. 29% said we've made good progress and have a plan. Yeah, so that's those stats are about what I would have expected. Um, you know, I'm not suggesting that you should rush out immediately and, and cloudify everything today because somebody else said you should, okay? But I will say that as machine learning and artificial intelligence get better, the benefits are going to be realized first in the cloud applications as opposed to the on-premises applications because of the million, the need for a million records like we talked about, uh, like I talked about a little bit earlier, okay? All right, so uh, super. So there's your there's your ADP uh, there's your ADP analysis that you have. Uh, notice that uh, there's some of, some folks believe that uh, AI is going to help smaller firms be more competitive with larger firms, um, and uh, AI tools will give their firm also believe that the AI tools will give their firm a competitive advantage. Um, 20% of them, 20% of the respondents there said that they believe that they will retire before AI has an effect on them. So that's kind of a kind of an interesting uh, interesting thing as well. Uh, so there are some AI applications out there. Uh, in fact, a lot of the a lot of the soundtrack music that you have in television in France is actually machine composed. Uh, so we can create stories and music. Uh, we can have self-driving vehicles. Uh, we have fraud detection in credit cards, debit cards, financial services, and so forth. Um, in healthcare, we have autonomous surgery with an autonomous robot. Um, uh, Watson doing uh, leukemia diagnosis uh, because there's so much research going on in the world of cancer now that a machine that can read all the stuff and have perfect recall of it has some advantage over a human in the amount of data that they can pull from very easily. Uh, we're also, again, assisting doctors with treatments on cancer. Um, so in video games, we're starting to see non-player characters, uh, that is, these uh, these tools created by the game uh, being used in here uh, as far back as 2008 in Left 4 Dead, and then uh, using neuroevolutionary training Supreme Commander 2 from 2010. So those are quite a few things in here. Now, the leading software that you have, uh, so again, you can see we have TensorFlow, which is which is out here, Crane, CYC, Azure Machine Learning Studio, Cloud Machine from Oracle. So you have quite a few quite a few different ones in here. Now these ones that you see are actually free. So uh, these particular ones that we have uh, just goes through and tells you who's doing these. You can go through here. You know, for example, for TensorFlow. Um, if you want to use the TensorFlow engine um, and use the ten you have a virtual machine that has the Tensor chip on it um, in Google's data center, that has a cost, however. So notice that these are all different uh, tools you have. Uh, other tools you have, uh, here's CTNK, that's a cognitive toolkit. Um, we have uh, MLilib and uh, NuPic and uh, Prediction.io and many others uh, that we have as well. So um, as we as we start thinking about these, don't overlook these productivity bots. Uh, I've actually got some content here in a few minutes on bots, but uh, what I think is important to note here is that is that uh, there are bots now in Salesforce and SurveyMonkey and Trello and Zapier and other things that will help you accomplish things, um, and you can ask questions of them almost like you would of a human. So if you've not tried this, you know, especially in Zoho with Zia or others, it's very, very interesting the things you can do, and there's actually you can actually do some natural language queries with it. 
Okay, so why is the why is the new technology better? Well, it's a method of data analysis that automates analytical model building. You can do this with um, you can do this with AWS, Azure, Google Cloud, AI, IBM Watson, SaaS. Um, if you use the wrong data set or have unguided conclusion, uh, you can end up with something you didn't expect. Um, you're going to use this when data can, when you, data can find an answer to a specific thing. It can be free. It can cost ten thousand an hour or anything in between, and it's going to it's going to replace repetitive or analytical human labor. Now, uh, the first jobs that are going to be lost in the accounting world are going to be people that are keying in accounts payable data. Uh, that a lot of that stuff has already gone offshore anyway. Uh, but as we as we look at at this, you know, the simple things again are going to be solved first, and then the more complex things are going to be much much later. Okay. Uh, so anyway, that's what we have on on summary on summarizing AI. Um, let's see if we have anything else we need to go through here before we wrap it up. Uh, so with that, I guess I'll turn it over to Div. Uh, do we do we have any questions to answer here? Uh, I don't believe we do right now, but if uh, if folks have other questions coming in, please uh, please go ahead and write those in, um, and and we'll try to get to those. Uh, while we're waiting, uh, Brian, did you want to do a couple more slides, or should I go ahead and do the fourth poll question? No, I'll go ahead. I'll do, go ahead and do a couple more slides here. Um, one of the things that I think is interesting is going to be the voice interfaces because those are starting to creep in. And you know, many of you have seen the Brady Bunch like this. Okay, so you know how we have Alice in the middle and Jan and Greg and Bobby and Susie and so forth. Well, now if we look at um, if we look at the babbling bunch, these are the voice interfaces, and there are a million of them out there. We have Alexa, we have Peg, Cortana, Siri, Alexa, or Alice, Google, and yes. That one really is called Alice, uh, Lucida AI, Watson, and Bixby. Okay, and what I think is important here is that there are relationships starting to exist between these. So, for example, Peg is Sage's bot that you can use to capture receipts and enter them. Um, Alexa um, actually is supposed to be working with Cortana, the artifact, the agent, or the voice interface that's built into Windows. And so that relationship is coming along, and uh, Microsoft's actually talked about it lately, and it's expected that sometime this year those two will be able to talk to each other. Now that was supposed to happen. Uh, by the end of last year, but what you'll be able to do in the future is say something along the lines of, Alexa, get Cortana. Hi, I don't know that. Hey Alexa, open Cortana. Open Cortana. So there you go. So that's proof that there's some things in there. Anyway, it's an interesting tra interesting change that we're going through and a very interesting time that we're going through where problems like voice interface that I've just demonstrated here um, are going to change the way that you work with uh, you work with the things that you do and, and so forth. Uh, interestingly enough, by the way, when you're on the line with, with somebody uh, like a, when you're on hold with someone like a, uh, like a credit card company or a um, or an airline or somebody like that one of the things that I've seen I've seen people make successful and I've been told by people that run call centers that this actually works many of the many of these uh, systems have have computers that are listening to what you say and supposedly if you use the words that you can't say on television in the background on hold you may get referred to somebody different than you would if you were just in a good mood so it's kind of an interesting uh, interesting use of the voice interface uh, technology that's out there. Okay, so Div, are we are we good on time here then? Uh, I think we are, so uh, let me go ahead. We've got about three, four minutes left here, so let me go ahead and, uh, and launch the fourth poll question here, if you don't mind. Sure. Okay, folks, so the fourth poll question is up. Uh, and the question is, how important are client accounting services and payroll to the future of your firm? Uh, and there are four options there, uh, ranging from they are my firm's future down to they aren't important to my firm's future. So go ahead and select one of those. Click the submit button uh, at the end to make sure your vote is counted. Again, this is the fourth of our poll questions, fourth and final of our poll questions today. Um, so we'll go ahead and give uh, about 20 seconds here for people to go ahead and get their votes in. 
And again, if you have any questions for uh, Brian in the meantime, please go ahead and write those in. You know, it's it's interesting to hear other professions' views on this. Um, when uh, when I was at, I was listening to this presentation by uh, by industry by industry technology analyst earlier today, and this analyst was actually saying that they thought accounting was going to get automated first, and I found that fascinating because I think the things that they think accounting is, um, like entering invoices into payables, and um, you know queuing things up for bill payment and applying account, accounts receivable things against the against open invoices. I think they think that that stuff is is what we do in the work as accountants, but that's bookkeeping as you all know. So uh, it's very interesting to it's very interesting to see this time right now because I think there's going to be a lot more opportunity for people that are sophisticated that use cloud-based tools and that can help people use these tools that are out there. Um, you know, it's and, and so again, it's it's going to be people that are analysts as opposed to people who are just doing the data data entry grunt type work uh, that I think are going to be successful in the long term. But there you will know, be funny. new data cleanup jobs for. Go ahead. Go ahead. Oh no, I, I was just going to say it's it's funny that you mentioned that in terms of the perception within and outside of the industry. Uh, Jay on just wrote in and asked, uh, wondering if the medical profession would be one that would suffer automation first. I just finished teaching a, a graduate level course at University of North Carolina um, on information systems, and it was primarily for health professionals. And uh, and a lot of the folks in there were very concerned about what AI was going to do there. But again, it's the same thing. It's how you view your profession and the core value that you're providing. Because if you see any profession as a series of transactions that are processed, then I think you see the threat and you see it much more as an ominous threat in the in the near term. But if you view it as more uh, high level value that you provide and the transactions are a gateway to that, I think then your perspective changes a little bit. Yeah, it's a it's a very interesting time in in all the professions out there. You know, there's a guy named Daniel Els Eskind that has written a book called the, the he's a Briton and I think he's a I think he's at the University of Oxford if I'm not mistaken and um, he uh, he's written some stuff about about how how the easy work that we used to have is is changing and that's true um, and so there are implications for all of us on that but when it comes to things like dealing with a difficult case at the Internal Revenue Service or resolving a difficult audit issue. I think those things are going to still be around uh, for some time, but it's going to be, it's going to be, you know, it's going to be a very different world. Yeah. Uh, okay. um, so, Brian, if you don't mind, I'm just going to go ahead and and do my closing slide here, and then if there's anyone else sure. who has questions, they can go ahead and write in as well. Super. Okay. Well, then uh, I'll let you go ahead and take it back then, folks. Thanks okay. for the opportunity today. I appreciate it. Absolutely. And Brian, thank you so much for your time today. I, I think this is a topic that there are so many more questions being asked about by accounts than there are sort of clear answers. And I think you've done a lot to, to help address that today. So thanks very much for uh, joining us. Any questions uh, for Brian, please go ahead and write those in. I also just wanted to mention before, uh, before we leave today, our next expert webinar is actually just five days away. Uh, we don't typically schedule them this close together, but this is how it worked out. And, and I think just as today's was essential uh, viewing and attending, I think next week's will be as well. Next week, we've got Tom Hood, the CEO of the Maryland Association of CPAs, always one of the uh, most influential people in terms of the future of accounting. And that's precisely what he's going to be talking about, the future of accounting, big waves of change and oceans of opportunity. Um, so don't miss that. That is Tuesday, July 31st, uh, same time, 2 p.m. If you haven't registered for all the expert web webinars yet, you can go to 2018webinars.com to go ahead and sign up for that. If you'd like a live personalized demo of Accountants World solutions for payroll and client accounting services, uh, and I know many of you have just mentioned how important those uh, two services are to the core of your practice moving forward. Um, so uh, I encourage you to go ahead and contact us via our website or at the 888 number that you see there, the toll-free number. And also a final reminder, if you'd like to get a copy of our practical guide to offering client accounting services profitably, um, just indicate that on your post-webinar survey. You'll see a question related to that guide, and we'll be happy to ship you a copy as soon as that's available.
So uh, once again, I want to thank uh, Brian for his time today. Thanks to all of you for joining us, and we look forward to seeing you next week. Thanks, everyone. All right. Thank you, Brian. Talk to you soon. Yep. Thanks.